All right. Uh, this is an, <clears throat> an oral history interview with Senator Thad Cochran of Mississippi. Uh, we're in the Senator's office in Washington, D.C., and uh, today is uh, Tuesday, April 10th, 2007, and I'm Brian Williams. Senator, let's start with your first contact with Senator Dole. When did that occur and what were the circumstances? I think I first met him uh, right after I was elected to Congress in 1972. Uh, Senator Dole was serving in the U.S. Senate at that time, and um, I didn't have any regular contact with him. House members are not only on the other side of the Capitol, but a freshman member of the House doesn't have an opportunity to be with senators on very much of the time. Uh, but I do think our paths did cross then. We have, of course, joint sessions of, of Congress to receive important messages either from the President on the State of the Union or from foreign uh, dignitaries who might visit the Congress mm -hmm. to present a message. And I would see him on those occasions during the six years I was in the House. And then, of course, I became a lot more um, better acquainted when I was elected to the Senate in 1978. And we served in the Senate for the balance of his t tenure in the Senate. Um, when you first ran for office for the House, um, you were doing something that was kind of unusual for a Republican in Mississippi. Is that correct? I mean, or at least uh, winning as you did um, was was not customary at the time. Right. Our state had not had a history of supporting Republican candidates, uh, and of course that came about traditionally, you know, as a result of the war between the states. Uh, Mississippi was considered a dependable state for the Democrats, uh, always supporting Democratic nominees for president, occasionally an independent, but uh, hardly ever a Republican. So what, I, I'm just, I, I want to get a little bit of this background in your own career because I think it's, it's, it's important and unusual. What prompted you to run as a Republican? Well, I was urged to do so by the local Republican Party, which was developing um, some ambitions to be competitive. And we had uh, seen our state vote for Barry Goldwater in 1964 pretty decisively in that election. And so the party lines were really being blurred and people really didn't have a strong sense of identity for either party uh, in Mississippi. I really think Mississippi was more of an independent state than, than a democratic state. But nonetheless, uh, by the time we got around to um, the election of 1968, the Republicans uh, asked if I would take an active role in um, the Nixon campaign uh, and be a part of, of a Citizens for Nixon organization. And as it turned out, I, um, I did that and agreed to be active in it. Um, I went to um, St. Louis, Missouri for an organizational meeting of uh, Citizens for, for Nixon, Agnew. After, this was after the convention had taken place and the nominees had been selected. But anyway, it was because of that active involvement, the fact that uh, the Nixon campaign was successful, uh, even though in Mississippi it wasn't successful at all. George Wallace carried the state running as an independent, and uh, uh, the Democratic candidate came in second, and Nixon was a poor third in the running that year. Now, Senator Dole at the time was uh, the chairman of the Republican National Committee, as I recall. Uh, he was early on. I'm not sure he was. 71 at that to point. 73, yeah. actually, yeah. So, do you make any connection between his being in charge of the party in that capacity and the growing success of Republicans in the South? Or uh, I think it was a confluence of coincidence, really, rather than um, any kind of strategical effort that uh, resulted in Mississippi or my running for Congress. Uh, Trent Light and I both decided to run for Congress that year and run on the Republican ticket. And that was the first time that, I guess you would say, people who had been identified as Democrats or uh, not identified as Republican before then were all of a sudden beginning to make decisions that the Republican Party probably was uh, a party we'd be more comfortable with in the future. And um, we both were successful that year. But I don't recall um, 
being involved in terms of personal contact with Senator Dole at that time. I do remember coming up to Washington and meeting with President Nixon, getting a photograph made. That ended up on the front of a brochure. And um, it, it, it was something that we used in terms of trying to establish an identity philosophically and uh, politically with the national leadership to show that we had access, we would be able to be welcomed for visits and uh, maybe represent the state more effectively in terms of getting our interests considered and taken seriously by the national government. So it was kind of an awakening of, uh, of, uh, of energy and spirit. Most of us were young. I was 34 years old. Trent was a couple of years younger than I. And uh, we were we were elected, and I think that really just established a beginning for our modern Republican Party. Recalling those first campaigns of yours, what were the hot button issues uh, in your state? Well, the Vietnam War was still a problem in terms of um, people being um, disappointed, you know, at how badly that had gone, and uh, how many people had been killed. Uh, we needed a new direction and a new sense of leadership with a purpose of winding up that war, getting it over with. It's an interesting parallel. You can think about the Iraq war right now, but um, it was truly something that uh, was a very sad and tragic time in, in the history of our country. And uh, we were hopeful that we'd be able to find some new answers and new ways of dealing with old problems that were becoming uh, almost intractable. Did it turn out that way? It did, indeed. Um, Nixon and his, his uh, associates developed a strategy. I think uh, Henry Kissinger was an important part of that process um, in negotiating settlements and getting the um, State Department involved. Uh, and then after that, you know, we, we could look back and say this is something that we, we've got behind us now. We can look forward to working on our economy, uh, the other challenges that we face to try to establish a better pattern of leadership for our country. So uh, when you think about paths crossing with Senator Dole over the years that he's, you were together in the Senate, what comes to mind? Well, he became uh, a person I looked up to almost immediately after being elected to the Senate. I had not had an opportunity to work closely with him before, but to see him um, working on the finance committee's legislation, which was very important, he was a, he was a true leader in that respect. And Howard Baker was our Republican leader, and I became very fond of him and um, looked up to him and had a good working relationship with him and Bob Dole and, and others too. We had a very uh, bright and uh, conscientious group of Republican senators who were providing um, a great sense of confidence for us in our in our government at that time. And. Uh, when he decided to uh, seek election as a Republican leader, of course, that was a very interesting campaign and involved several senators. I think there were five or six Republicans who were in that race. I remember Jim McClure and Pete Domenici, Dick Luger, uh, were all involved. And uh, Bob, Bob Dole ended up being, being the leader and did a great job. Um, how would you describe his leadership style? Well, he was uh, he, he was easy to, to be with. He was accessible. He was not pretentious in any way whatsoever. You felt very comfortable in his presence, and uh, so you trusted him. And uh, he he was not a tyrant. He didn't try to pressure people. Um, his style was more of. Uh, you know, asking you to do something, and uh, if you decided you could do it and help him and support him, uh, he was pleased. But if you didn't, he didn't argue with you or question your motives or, or in any way, uh, act as if he uh, was just disapproved of your judgment or anything like that. He truly respected all all, all the senators. Um, and uh, those of us who were, who were younger and hadn't had the experience that he had truly appreciated his manner, his warmth, his genuine uh, honesty, 
and his energy that he brought to the job. He was a tireless worker. Can you think of some, uh, you mentioned fi uh, financial matters, some of the bills that he pushed through uh, the Senate that were really critical in, in, your, in your mind? Well, he, he did a lot of things for people who were disadvantaged, and this includes uh, education, um, education initiatives. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act comes to mind as one that he absolutely was the father of that. And, uh, not only did he have these good ideas and good instincts and uh, good sound judgment about what the federal government ought to be doing and could be doing to be helpful to America's citizens, but he had the skill to bring people together and work out problems. If you had a suggestion that was a modification in effect or some uh, other idea, he would listen carefully and incorporate your idea in the bill. Some some way, uh, by addition of supporters, uh, giving you an amendment to to the bill or suggesting that you uh, you know provide some language that you thought would could improve the bill on some point or another. Uh, he he didn't have he didn't have to have it his his way all the way, and he he reached out for ideas and suggestions about how to improve legislation that he had already introduced or was handling on the floor. And you know, if you feel like you've been a part of the work product, then your tendency is to support it and defend it and help make it work. So um, it's an it's an interesting uh, way he had of going about this, and it wasn't like he was conniving or thinking about this uh, strategy all the time. It was just a part of his nature. I've read in a few cases where people observed that uh, he tended to be somewhat abrupt and impatient if you didn't come forth right quick with uh, whatever he was looking for or you are expressing your own ideas. That may have been more staffish. I was going to say, it sounds like somebody who worked for him, <laughs> not with him. <laughs> but his, his relationship with other senators was uh, anything but that. Uh, he was very accommodating and very easy to be with. I, I don't ever recall seeing him lose his temper or berate another senator or have any get into any kind of argument with a with a with a senator. He could disagree, state a point that, that might not be consistent with what the other person had said, but it was never in an argumentative way. Um, and can you think of some bad moments? Well, uh, he was in the leadership. Well, losing the election for president, I think, was a bad moment. That was a tough campaign, and uh, I did have the pleasure and good fortune of, of getting to work closely in the in the campaign with him at his at his invitation. You know, I don't really recall how many people would be around this one table in the leader's offices. <clears throat> we were moving toward uh, the beginning of that campaign, but. I thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity of working closely with him in his campaign for president and in San Diego being there when he was nominated and my room that I had at the hotel, the convention hotel was right across the hall or around the corner from his his suite that he had. And he reached out particularly to Chuck Grassley and to me, to Pete Domenici. Uh, I recall the three of us being present at a lot of meetings and a lot of discussions about strategy and um, policies and how to how to win the election. So that was something that I really appreciated the opportunity that he gave me, and um, I always look back upon that as a real unique experience that I've had because of Bob Dole. In 96, uh, were you thinking maybe I'd be the VP or <laughs> that you had a sight on the ground? <clears throat> no, I didn't, think, I didn't think it would be a good choice, that I would be a good choice for a running mate. Uh, but I think he did, he did look to uh, those of us who were involved for advice and counsel. And he may have, I think he had a list. He never told me about it. And one day he made some comment later on, you know, you were on that list. And, uh, but it was a good while after the election was over and everything. Um, but it, I would not have been a good choice geographically or for, uh, there were a lot of others who would have been better choices. Mississippi, 
would not be a strategic state in the mix of uh, presidential politics. And New York would have been better. You know, Jack Kemp ended up being chosen, and he was a great campaigner. He worked hard, and he, he did a good job on the campaign trail with, with Bob Dole. Prior to San Diego, then, you were out <laughs> on the hustings with uh, Bob Dole? We'd travel some together, and, and I would go around the South to other states on my own with some of the campaign staff. Uh, trying to, you know, get people stirred up and energized and involved in the campaign. But I do recall making uh, several stops in the South <clears throat> in small planes going from one place to another. One of my former staff members had an active role in the staff, at the staff level in the campaign. Keith Hurd, who's here in Washington, as a matter of fact, I think he had a, he was a coordinator for the Southeastern United States. And uh, I, I remember traveling with Keith a good bit during that campaign. And tell me about your first encounter with Senator Dole after the election. Well, I, I don't really recall having much contact. You know, after the, the um, election is over with, you go back to work. You know, we all had a job to do in the U.S. Senate. And um, you know, we... we got going again on that. We had run a hard and determined campaign. Bill Clinton had just done a better job of getting votes than we did. Do you want to stop and have a yeah, bit thanks. of water? Yeah. Good. Um, I want to ask you about one bill in, in, in particular, and that was health care. Uh, because uh, I've read it, uh, some things about you being involved in, in that uh, at the committee level and with uh, Senator Moynihan and Bob Dole, and there was a fair amount of duking it out or something in, on that. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Or? Well, I was on the Appropriations Committee, not the Finance Committee, and the Finance Committee had jurisdiction over the writing of that bill. So <clears throat> I, I did not have a particularly important or active role uh, at that stage in the process, what Senator Moynihan would have. And uh, he was a formidable senator, as you know, and a good friend as well. I think I remember Bob taking more of a leadership role in uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. <clears throat> that was certainly something that he was well known for. He understood it. He cared a great deal about it from his own personal experiences, the challenges that people face, <clears throat> and the fact that the federal government really didn't have a program, uh, a predictable level of support for people in need of services and uh, health care and other support. Um, but he, he clearly was a, was a leader in that. I was on the Agriculture Committee with him, and so I saw him more on a day-to-day -day basis there. But because of that committee's jurisdiction over nutrition and uh, the food stamp program and other um, uh, food and nutrition assistance programs, uh, he is well known with George McGovern. They would work closely together, together and um, make sure that our committee would report out legislation on those subjects. <clears throat> he expanded some of our feeding programs worldwide, too. This was another initiative that he had. And of course, people say, well, he's doing that to help the farmers. You know, Kansas is a farm state. The more wheat you can grow and sell, make into foodstuffs, uh, the better off those farmers are going to be. Have the government buy their pro products and, and ship them overseas. So the, you know, the so-called Food for Peace programs, these programs always had a strong leader in Bob Dole, and he, he cared about it deeply, not just because he was from the farm state. But uh, I think he really was a very sympathetic person for, for those who were, who were not well nourished, who were having a hard time staying alive. Uh, he wanted to be helpful. He thought uh, our country was strong enough, wealthy enough, we ought to be able to make a difference. And we did, and it was through the legislation in many cases that he had helped write or wrote himself and uh, got passed in the Senate and worked with the House to, to get it enacted into law. I think that's called a win-win situation. Yes, that's a win-win situation. Um, 
let's let's go uh, back to ADA for a moment. Was there any significant opposition to that uh, in the Senate? I don't recall any real formidable opposition to it. And there were some who thought, well, maybe it cost too much. Barry Goldwater was a fellow who <clears throat> always looked at bills very critically, whether it was involving wasteful spending. He would um, he would argue against it, but <clears throat> I don't recall his opposition to that specifically. And uh, but there were other senators. Sometimes Jesse Helms sort of took the lead in in guarding the treasury and and speaking against programs. A lot of people thought he was not sympathetic to poor people or to you know, people who were African Americans. He had a reputation of being kind of a tough-minded conservative, but he was doing what he thought was right too. And the, the, the genius of Bob Doe was he could work with Jesse Helms, who was on the Agriculture Committee, and they could work together and find common ground on these issues and, and uh, move forward. Um, so it was surprising to some people that, that Bob Dole could get along with these other strong personalities and people who had different views philosophically maybe on how, what gov the government role ought to be and still work out a compromise and get something done in the end. What about NAFTA? Um, was that a hard-fought uh, battle in the Senate? Well, the Finance Committee would have jurisdiction over trade uh, issues, and I'm sure he was involved with that. I don't recall <clears throat> any personal um, speeches or actions he, that Bob Dole took in regard to NAFTA. Uh, I think he supported the agreement, helped shape it. Um, but I think there were others maybe who were a little farther out front on that than he was. That's nice to my recollection. Now, you served on several committees with him. Well, just agriculture, to be honest. And what was he like as a committee member? Oh, he was very hardworking and serious-minded. And on agriculture, you know, he was one of the real leaders. He had been there a long time uh, when I got to the committee. And uh, that was one of the first assignments I had in the Senate. My predecessor in the Senate, <clears throat> Jim Eastland of Mississippi, had been a chairman of that committee. Uh, he was chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, Herman Talmadge was actually the chairman when I first came on the committee from Georgia. So that, that committee had a, a, a legacy, a history of, of Southerners being in conspicuous positions of leadership on that committee. And, uh, but Bob Doe got along well with everybody. Uh, it was there were regional uh, differences on some issues, and even Senator Dole and I disagreed on <clears throat> certain farm programs because the way they would be administered, uh, the cotton program particularly was was a unique um, activity in in farm country <clears throat> because it was more localized in the deep south. And sometimes there was there was resentment from other parts of the country that the cotton program cost so much in comparison with the uh, dollar amount of subsidies that were paid to growers. Um, but nonetheless, you know, as as with most important programs where you have differences of opinion, you you work out the differences and maybe it's around the border, the edges. Uh, but the cotton program was always one that Bob Doe would figure out a way to support um, so he could keep the farm groups all together at the end that we could all support the bill and defend against all amendments, whether it was aimed at cotton or wheat or corn or dairy or the other programs. Uh, and so that was one of the reasons why the agriculture bills usually passed, because we had this broad base of support that was first formed in the Agriculture Committee, and Bob Doe was really an architect who would bring together these disparate interests and make sure they stayed glued together and mutually supportive as the bill made its way through Congress. What, what were the issues that the bills, the farm bills, dealt specifically with in the period that we're talking about? Well, how you deal with disasters, or weather-related disasters, or a problem common to all farmers. There would always be a disaster provision of the bill, giving the government the authority to come in and <clears throat> make some contribution to alleviating the consequences of, of uh, weather-related disasters. That would be something that would cut across all 
commodity areas of interest. Um, some of the other things were, were trade and the level of subsidies for growers and how you calculated those benefits and the uh, entitlement definitions of who would be entitled to, to them. Uh, there were just a lot of details that had to be worked out. As someone who is fiscally conservative, um, was there ever times when you felt uh, like you were you were not uh, contradicting yourself in a way by by making sure that these subsidies and tax credits and so forth were being given to the farmer? Mm -hmm. I mean, was that were there moments of tension there? Well, of course, and there were some people who would vote against those bills because they thought <clears throat> they were unnecessarily generous to well wealthy farmers that there ought to be a level beyond which a farmer's wealth would disqualify him from benefits. <clears throat> but um, the argument would prevail that uh, you, you had to apply this to the land. These were like benefits that run with the land, and you don't discriminate on the basis of whether a farmer is wealthy or middle class or poor, you know, anyone who's engaged has a, has a risk of, at some level, and they all ought to be treated uh, the same. If you, start, if you start discriminating against people who, are, who have been successful in the past, well, you're going to probably uh, have, make it more difficult to attract enough activity in the agriculture sector to make it productive, or to make it efficient. In your state, uh, does agribusiness dominate uh, the farming industry, or how does it break out? Now, we have a substantial number of people who are involved in agriculture in Mississippi, <clears throat> but we have a lot of other interests, too, economic interests, and some of it is national defense, shipbuilding industries on the Gulf Coast, and uh, other military bases and manufacturing facilities related to uh, military activity. Those are all important as well. But what I, I, what I was wanting to hear you uh, talk about was the proportion of small farm, the family farm still exists in Mississippi, I presume, and, but has, has lar have large corpor corporations taken over most of the farming in, in, in Mississippi? No, I would say that uh, I don't have the exact numbers right here. You can look them up, and I'm sure the Department of Agriculture can, <clears throat> can give you something about the number of landowners and how much land they own. And they have a lot of people who lease land and farm it. Um, but many of those people who own the land are still in the state. They're not necessarily just absentee landlords. But there's a mix. We have some of every kind. Um, you mentioned uh, Bob Dole's interest in, in uh, international and, and food programs and whatnot. Um, as, as I've been doing my research on the man, uh, it's become clear that he did have quite a bit of, of interest in other issues beyond the United States. And could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I do, I do think he had the broad view and had um, a great deal of interest in the world. You know, his involvement in the war, I'm sure, brought home to him that we needed to have a strategy for keeping the peace around the world and that there was a, a, a need for the Congress and individual members of Congress and the Senate to understand international relations and how we could work together in the community of nations to solve problems without resorting to war. Were there some issues where you and, and Bob Dole really parted company? I don't really recall any. Um, I'm sure we, we disagreed on a thing or two, but <clears throat> that, <clears throat> I don't remember them. Um, in, a, in a few words, um, I, I, I want to go through a, a number of the leaders of the Republican Party during your, your tenure. What, what words would come to mind to describe uh, Howard Baker? Well, he was a genuinely warm and uh, caring kind of <clears throat> person. He was easy to be with, always seemed to be accessible. He never felt threatened <clears throat> in any way by Howard Baker. 
he was very smart and very diligent in terms of uh, the seriousness that he brought to uh, his responsibilities. Uh, when, when I was first elected to the Senate, he was the <clears throat> he was the Republican leader, and uh, we became the majority party uh, when he was Republican leader, and he did a wonderful job. Um, as leader, he was a good example for the rest of us in how he handled himself on the floor of the Senate, speaking always uh, in an articulate way. I don't ever recall his really losing his temper or showing that he was upset or out of control in any way at all. He respected the leaders on the other side. He was good friends with most senators. Um, he, uh, he was someone I was very fond of and still am. Bob Dole brought a lot of the same uh, attributes to the leadership uh, responsibilities that he had as well. They were a good bit alike, I thought. Did you see times when you thought perhaps uh, Bob Dole was really modeling himself in certain instances on uh, Howard Baker or not? No, I think he was just, he was being himself uh, all the time. And, and he was a unique personality, very strong-willed. And he had a, a lot of energy. He, he could be out on the floor of the Senate handling a bill, managing a bill, and be there for hours and hours, and uh, not seem to get tired or, or uh, as they say down south, frazzled in any way, keeping his composure, being, being courteous to everybody, but also being a strong leader and uh, an influence and articulate, uh, persuasive influence in the Senate. I think probably uh, Bob Dole could have been the best, you know, strategist, um, tactician that served in the Senate while I've been here. What about Robert Byrd? Robert Byrd is an unusual person, and he has seniority over all of us and uh, a determination to serve forever, but um, that may not happen, but uh, some will be surprised. Um, he is a person that's so devoted to the Senate as an institution and, and uh, has a reverence and a feeling of respect, fondness uh, uh, for it that is unequaled. He's devoted uh, to his job, to his duties as a senator, and uh, enjoys talking on the floor of the Senate, uh, maybe too much <laughs> sometimes, but it's uh, out of a sense of strong conviction that what he's doing is important and uh, the country is, uh, is worth devoting his life and energies to uh, preserving and improving. So I have a, an enormous amount of personal respect and appreciation for, for Robert Byrd. Uh, I remember my wife and I traveled with him and his wife Rama on a long trip uh, to Turkey one time, and we we um, we spent about ten days, I think, in Turkey, or maybe the trip lasted ten days. And uh, he was really adored in that, in Turkey. He had made some speeches and he had led an effort to uh, support Turkey's interests on some foreign relations matter where they were in conflict with um, others in that region. And uh, he was treated as a sort of a national hero. People would recognize him on the streets as ordinary people. And we would want to touch him or speak to him. And it was an interesting thing to observe. How, as majority leader, uh, how did he work with those of you on the other side of the aisle? Well, he always worked well with me personally. I've never had a problem with it. <clears throat> and, uh, but he could be demanding and um, um, he wanted to win. He wanted to have his way, but usually his way was to get something done, whatever the issue was, to get it done. And he could be as determined, uh, more determined than any senator we have to accomplish his goals 
and be prepared to stay there as long as they needed to stay there and to get a, to get them done. And so he's a very effective senator. George Mitchell? A very bright and hardworking fellow. Not much sense of humor. Uh, when the challenges got tough, he could be stern, determined, but he was successful too. We've been very lucky uh, to have talented, true patriots uh, who are willing to step forward and assume responsibilities of leadership during the time I've been in the Senate. Um, and George Mitchell is one of the best. I'm not going beyond that because mm -hmm. you're concentrating on Senator yeah. Cole's career. Um, which of those leaders would you most want to be serving under again? Well, I didn't serve under any of them. We are a group of equals, and uh, that's another part of the art of being a leader in the Senate is understanding that, you know, understanding that everyone has the right to speak as long as they have the floor on any subject they want to talk about, and they can do it as long as they can stand there and talk unless 60 senators vote to shut off debate. And it's not usual that you can get 60 senators to vote to shut off debate if another senator wants to talk. And they, if they abuse the privilege, then cloture can be invoked and is invoked. But all of these people have, uh, have been truly uh, impressive, and, uh, and I, I, I respected them all enormously. I wouldn't want to have to choose one over the other. I want to ask you a few questions about your own um, senatorial career. Uh, I was struck by how many different committees you have served on mm -hmm. over time. Um, how do you how do you manage that? Um, I had a short attention span. <laughs> I enjoyed the variety and the challenge of new subjects and undertakings. And um, but getting on the appropriations committee pretty well takes care of. Any subject that comes before the government has to be funded it to some extent. And the Appropriations Committee is where the bills are written that fund all the departments and all the programs of the federal government. So if you're on appropriations, which I was lucky enough to get on after just two years in the Senate, I, I enjoyed it uh, and have you know, become chairman. I was chairman in the last Congress. Um, for two years, and then we lost control of the Senate, and I'm not chairman anymore. But nonetheless, uh, we have we have all of the subcommittees divided up so that each department of the government kind of looks to one subcommittee uh, for its funding, uh, and, and an individual bill is written to fund that department's budget for the next fiscal year. And getting to hear all the witnesses come from that agency or the department and its agencies talking about what the money is to be used for and gives you an opportunity to really get an understanding and a breadth of appreciation of everything the government's involved in. So you're, you're not a specialist particularly in any one subject area. Uh, if you're on appropriations, you tend to be a generalist, but you learn a lot about a lot of different things. And I've enjoyed that challenge. It's been a unique opportunity, and uh, I've been very grateful to have that chance to do, to do that. What about some other favorite committees that you've served? Well, agriculture is one I've served on ever since I first came here. I succeeded Jim Eastland, uh, who was a farmer and a leader on the agriculture committee, although he wasn't chairman. He was chairman of judiciary. Um, I, uh, I enjoyed that. It, I had never been personally active in farming except cattle farming. My family had a small cattle farm and uh, I grew up knowing about that. Um, my grandparents' generation on both sides had farmed. Um, when my mother's family had a cotton farm and they grew corn, they had cattle. and um, but those were, that was a different era. Those were different times. <clears throat> the modern agriculture industries are so much more like businesses and are run in a different way. They're not fam small family farms like ours was. Um, but I enjoyed, I enjoyed that committee and still do. Uh, it does have diverse jurisdiction, food assistance programs. Um, come under the jurisdiction. The year I served as chairman, we rewrote and improved the 
school lunch program in uh, legislation. We wrote something called the Healthy Forest Act. We have jurisdiction uh, over the forests and the national forest um, managers. That was an interesting challenge. Um, governmental affairs, I was on that committee at one time. I enjoyed that, a lot of unique jurisdictional uh, opportunities. Uh, nuclear non-proliferation. I spent a lot of time working on, <clears throat> on on those issues as a member of that committee, and actually chaired a subcommittee that published a report about the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, uh, which I think was an important contribution to our understanding the threats we face, and it led to the adoption of the National Missile Defense Act. Because of the proliferation of these missile systems and technologies that can threaten to inflict damages over long, di over long distances, it became clear that we were vulnerable to a lot of different uh, challenges in that area. We needed to get busy and develop a system that could defend against that. We've now achieved that goal. Uh, as a result of not only that act, but a lot of good research and hard work by the experts in the field who've brought our technologies together and used them in a way that protects us. Some people were worried that this was going to just mean a worldwide ex escalation of, of weaponry and missiles, but uh, that has not been the case. We're, we're, more, we're a lot more safe today than we ever have been um, because we do have these capabilities now. Are you talking about strictly offensive? I'm talking, talking about our defensive Your, missile, our national missile defense act where we have the capability of knocking down missiles and we just proved that just a couple of weeks ago with a test out in the Pacific. Um, anyway, we're making good progress. Um, I I'd lost my... Oh, yes. Um, what about any reflections on your period of time on the Ethics Committee? What was that like? Well, that's tough duty. <laughs> You're put in a position of having to, having to make decisions about whether somebody's conduct has been <clears throat> contrary to the rules of the Senate, and those are, those are not pleasant duties to have to look into things like that. But, as they say, somebody has to do it. And, um, I'm glad I served and got that over with at an early point in my career. I've been lucky enough to avoid serving on the Ethics Committee for a good number of years now, and I'm glad to let other people have that duty. Um, talk about your service uh, as head of the, of the Republican Conference. Mm -hmm. that? Well, that's an interesting challenge. Uh, under our organization, this is the... This is the office where we try to develop ways of communicating more effectively with our constituents, being sure we let folks back home know what you are doing that um, will help you uh, in the eyes of your constituents um, continue to serve in the Senate. If people want to run for re-election, they'll have the tools to communicate. We have a video studio. We have. Um, people who work there who can translate what you're doing into um, readable releases of information back to home state media. And that's basically what we tried to do. We would bring the conference together, all the members, the Republican members of the Senate together, on a regular basis to talk about party policies too. So it had some substance to it. But I didn't really try to tell people what they ought to think about the issues. I just presided at the meeting and would encourage others to, to do research in certain areas that were of interest right then as national issues, national problems that needed to be addressed. And wanted to be sure that our Republicans in the Senate were together, if we could be, uh, in proposed solutions and could present a united front of uh, uh, dealing with some of the challenges, whether you're talking about crime in the streets or education, uh, international trade, immigration, and uh, how we deal with our borders, border security. 
there's so many things that you can really get your teeth into that needed to be looked at. We would we would develop a small group of senators and and uh, staff members and assign them the challenge of coming up with some some plan to improve our our national response to this problem or that problem. Or look down the future. What do you see are the emerging problems that we need to be thinking about that we can we can anticipate and uh, let's be prepared to deal with them when they when they become um, more obvious to the general public. So there was an interesting uh, opportunity to make make you think and work a little harder and get people talking and working together in a cohesive way. Now, you're talking about the conference? The conference of the Republican the, Conference. Then describe to me the difference between that group and the policy committee. Well, the policy committee is, uh, is a committee of the conference, the Republican Policy Committee. Um, <clears throat> that committee is supposed to come up with the answers to the, to the questions, you know, this is what we ought to, and present a paper, this is what we ought to do or think about this, and this is where we can talk about this issue that makes sense to the American people and a way to discuss our views develop our views and discuss those in, a, in an effective way. Did you see, thinking now about Senator Dole's term as leader, uh, were there any structural changes in the party along these lines that we've been talking about that he authored or occurred during his period? Well, he was a very uh, hands-on kind of leader. He he liked to participate in, the, in this process. And, um, a lot of the times, he would actually lead these discussions himself. It would, you know, when the conference would meet, if the, if he was there and uh, wanted to be heard, um, he had the floor, and he, he had the right of first recognition. I guess is one way you could say it, as a matter of courtesy to the leader. And uh, he commanded respect because he did understand a lot of these issues. He said he had good political instincts and judgment. He was easy to follow. Um, and uh, he did a great job as leader. It sounds like a really invigorating experience to be dealing with all these issues. Well, it is indeed. It really is. It's a unique opportunity. Not many people get a chance to serve in the Senate, much less have positions of responsibility in the Senate. And um, it's quite a, a nice challenge, but also one that you realize is quite important. It must, it must feel good to be a senator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've enjoyed it. It really has been a good thing for me to do. Um, looking back over the last, I guess, fifth of the 20th century, um, it strikes me that there's kind of a continuing battle between those who, who want uh, to favor the private sector and those that want to have more government programs, I guess would be one way of putting it. Do you think that will always remain sort of the, the two, two sides of things as we go forward mm -hmm. in history? Well, I think there will be people you know, who will resist the growth of government and the expansion of government power. Uh, some people just say, well, you know, I just want to be left alone. Well, that's great if you don't have a problem, you know, and you're totally successful or never have had an accident um, or made a mistake. But uh, I think in our mature political system that we have now, uh, we've evolved to the point where the people who are on those fringes, you know, are getting fewer and fewer. Most people are beginning to uh, be somewhere in the middle of those extremes. And I think that's good. I think one thing that's helped is, you know, communications, access to information. Being able to watch the Senate live from the time we or, uh, open the Senate until we adjourn in the evening. If you wanted to, you could tune in and watch the whole thing. Of course, you can't see what's going on across the room or behind the, in the other meeting room. And, but with the access to all the different channels and everything of, of, of information televised as well, um, we've all become, I think, a little more moderate as a country. Um, the extremes don't control and can't control as they once could, and I think that's a very good thing. And you've been described as a bridge between the two perspectives, I guess we might say, so you've been a man of your time. Well, it's been an interesting thing. You know, 
I was I was worried that I, you know, because of my view of myself as sort of a generalist uh, and someone who's not really real conservative or real liberal, but more of a moderate, uh, that I might have difficulty. But it's really been uh, the place for me to be. I felt more comfortable than I thought I would. And um, when, that suited when, me. When did your comfort level... I think it's a gradual thing. It takes time. And I think the experience and getting to know senators and getting to know the institution and how it all works and the administrative agencies and departments and figuring out who's responsible for what. Just over time and just by osmosis, you're going to uh, elevate your sense of understanding and your depth of appreciation of uh, how great our government really is and how resilient it is. You mentioned televi television in the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts about prior to television and after? What changes did you see occur? Well, I think the biggest one is it made us all more self-conscious. Um, you became conscious of, you know, how you sounded. You could see yourself in uh, being taped and replayed. Um, and in most of the committees, we have access to, but television has access to filming. And, uh, all, all of the uh, systems in the committee rooms now are tied in with a communication, audio communication system. So members of the staffs can listen to a, a radio, in effect, um, live, and you can hear everything that's going on in that committee. But as a participant, you're aware that everybody's listening. And so you're more careful, I think, about how you act and how you talk and what you say. You tend to, to be more cautious, I think. Some people don't, but most senators, I think, are affected that way. So you tend to prepare, know what you're talking about before you start talking, so you won't be uh, viewed as somebody who's ill-informed or um, doesn't make any sense. Uh, they'll replace you, <laughs> as they should, if you're not doing well. Considering the committee of the whole, um, how is it uh, television affected attendance and uh, debate? Well, it's. Um, I think the debate, I've just covered that part, uh, because you are more moderate, I think. There are some who I guess would tend to show off maybe, and histrionics creep into a higher level than would otherwise be the case. But I think even before television you saw, you saw uh, senators realizing that everything they said is going to be taken down. But, you know, you could then change it. That's the way you did it in the old days. And when I first came up here, you could get up on the floor and make a speech. And then, and, and then the recorders of the debate would type that up and print it out. You had a chance to go back into a room and, re and read it and edit it so that the final version was polished, and if you had time to do that. And I always took time to do that. And uh, my parents being school teachers, I think I didn't want to get a bad grade from my parents. <laughs> and so I would uh, make sure that what I thought I said, I did say, even if it meant changing the, the text a little bit. But that is a consequence, I think, of the exposure that has increased over time with the technologies that we all have now. So you tend to think about what you say before you get up and start talking. Do you revise uh, the congressional record anymore? Or? Not, not often. Occasionally I will, I will uh, look at it. And uh, there is a permanent record that's made, too, that gives you two or three days uh, grace period. So if you, if you did misspeak and you see that you did, or you, if it was not recorded accurately, that happens, too. We do have these stenographers who take down everything you say as they say it, as you say it, but then they can make mistakes, too. And I always was suspicious that they might be making a mistake, and I wanted to be sure they hadn't. So I, when I was younger, I, I always read the record and to be sure it, it was what I thought I said or meant to say. Uh, now I don't have time to do that. Um, there are too many other demands, so sometimes I don't go back in and edit. 
Um, I sometimes ask people this question when I'm doing oral history interviews. If, if there's a day that you could relive because it was very important to you, uh, does any, any day come to your mind? No, I'm going back now, and I thought about the impeachment of Richard Nixon. That happened right after I got up here. I mean, the, uh, the elections of 72 were the, was the campaign year, you know, with Watergate. And of course, it wasn't until after that campaign was over that all everything started coming out. And I, I recall I defended uh, uh, President Nixon without knowing what the facts were, you know. And that was something that I wish I had said in a little different way. I remember one time seeing a headline in the newspaper in one of my county papers, uh, Claiborne County, county seat Port Gibson, right on the Mississippi River, south of Vicksburg. And I'd been down there to speak to some group, and I was asked a question about the impeachment proceedings that were developing and the talk of impeachment. And I said, well, President Nixon, in my opinion, is unimpeachable. And then I went on to explain my trust and confidence in him and his intelligence and his leadership skills and on and on and on and on. <laughs> of course, that headline was Nick Cochran says Nixon unimpeachable, you know, right across the top of the paper. I, when I saw that several years later, I thought, whoa, I wish I could have changed that up a little bit. So there have been things like that, but that one comes to mind. Mentioning Nixon, I think maybe this is where we ought to uh, conclude today, but um, did you spend any time with him? Mm -hmm. yes. What was he like? Well, one of the brightest, uh, and with a command of foreign relations and international um, activity, people, personalities, history, anybody you'd want to meet. And even when he, he left Washington and he was he would just come back for occasional visits. Bob Dole actually organized a meeting where he, he invited several senators to come in and just have a sort of around the room who's sitting in chairs like this, and President Nixon would be there, eight of us maybe, sitting in a room, and he was just talking about his thoughts on the current foreign policy challenges facing the country and his observations. and. His, it was, a, it was like a tutorial, you know, in, in a, at a major university with, with the authority uh, of the country. That's the kind of respect that he absolutely could, could generate in his uh, command of the issues and understanding of people and uh, the effects of events on the future of our country. Uh, it was a fascinating experience. But he continued to be very active in keeping up with things that were going on and, and giving of himself in situations like that. Did you have any similar experiences with Ronald Reagan? No. <laughs> he was a wonderful personality and a genuinely warm and friendly person. I never had the kind of respect for Ronald Reagan, I have to admit. Uh, in terms of his intelligence and perceptions, as I did of uh, Richard Nixon. But Ronald Reagan could mesmerize a group, could convince a group of congressmen to support him and stick with him on this issue or that issue. Um, and he had good, solid support from staff members who were committed to ensuring that he was a successful president. And he surrounded himself with talented people who uh, really made it, made it work, made it work out, and helped him uh, write the things that he said. But he could say them so well, and he was such a genuinely good person, an honest person, uh, with no real meanness or evil about him at all, that the combination of personality and presentation and genuineness of spirit and everything uh, made him a wonderful leader. So it was, it was an interesting comparison and contrast between Nixon and Reagan in that regard. Just a few words on George Bush, the first. Oh, I liked him so much. He was just, he's the kind of guy you want to be with wherever you are and whatever you're doing. He's, he's easy, uncomplicated, totally uh, warm, good-natured, good good-humored. He's a, he, he loved so many different things. He loved to play tennis, he loved to fish, he loved 
uh, be outside doing something. He was. He had a lot of energy and a, a lot of warmth, uh, and a genuinely friendly person. Um, I don't know of anybody that my wife and I enjoyed being with any more than George Herbert Walker Bush um, before he was president, after he was president, while he was president, and Barbara just was the icing on the cake. She was just uh, totally charming, and I remember um, we were going through a reception, receiving line one night at the White House, my wife and I, I said, what am I supposed to call Barbara? And she had over, we were close enough, I, she heard me, and she said, well, Barbara, of course, is what you call me. <laughs> and then she turned to my wife and said, hi, love, and they said, she said, hi, love. She was just such a warm and personable and uh, easy to be with person, put everybody at ease. And what about Bill Clinton? Well, Bill Clinton is a neighbor. I mean, he was an Arkansas person. Uh, I sort of watched him, you know, not at too close a range because I'd never really met him, except we were working on the, there was a Delta Commission involved in Arkansas, Mississippi, um, Tennessee, I think, was involved. And we were, we were trying to put together some regional activities and programs. And I was up here in, in Congress, in the Senate, and he was governor down there. And, and we, our paths would cross from time to time. And he was always in good humor, you know. And he's easy to be with, too, like a lot of politician types. But um, he's real smart and worked work, work real hard all the time. But you never knew exactly what he was up to. <laughs> you know? And I'm not saying that in a critical way, but you just didn't know exactly what was going on with him. You know? uh, sometimes he'd say one thing and you know, then do something else. Uh, but I'm not saying he was dishonest. He just, um, he just had a lot of different aspects to his personality. It made him a little more complicated, I think, than, uh, than others. Thanks a lot for this time. Yeah, thank you. It's been a really interesting interview. This has been a pleasure. Good.